Thank you, Sharon. Um, I had a flashback of when I started my PhD program. Um, I was six months pregnant, and I had uh, my son four months in. And um, I came back to class, and most of the time I had friends or family to take care of him, but there were a couple times when I didn't. Quanah is the um, best educated uh, two-year-old around. <laughs> He's been to a few grad seminars, although we stopped when he started crawling because he'd crawl up and down the hall. Um, so thank you. Uh, it's nice to have children uh, at events like this. Um, I'd like to uh, next introduce uh, our, our, our next writer, uh, Greg Schofield. Um, actually, the third time I met Greg, uh, I was invited to his home, and uh, Greg has one of the most uh, uh, beautiful homes I've been in, not in the sense of his, his decorating skills are, are hard, to, uh, <laughs> hard to compete with. And uh, I was thankful because my little, I think he was about 15 months, very curious, and, and Greg was very calm as Quana <laughs> tried to uh, swat the path through, uh, through Greg's home. Um, so I'm very thankful that, that Greg was able to come uh, and be a part of this with us. Uh, Greg is a Canadian Aboriginal writer whose five collections of poetry have earned him both a national and international audience. He is known for his unique and dynamic reading style that blends oral storytelling, song, spoken word, and the Cree language. His poetry and memoir, Thunder Through My Veins, is taught at universities and colleges throughout Canada and the US, and his work has appeared in many anthologies. His latest collection, Kipotikan, Poems New and Selected, a republication of I, T I Knew Two Métis Women, which comes with a companion CD, and his third collection of poetry, Love Medicine and One Song will all be released in 2009. He currently lives in Maple Ridge, BC. Please join with me in welcoming Greg. Good, uh, good evening. I'm really um, honored to be here. I'm going to, I've got uh, I'd originally picked some poems that I wanted to read, and then, of course, I changed that up halfway through. Um, I don't want to spend too much time up here talking and, uh, and what have you. We've been doing a lot of talking the last couple of days. But, uh, of course, just before I begin my reading, I wanted to, uh, I want to acknowledge again that, uh, the territory of uh, the people on which uh, we're sitting, in which I'm standing. just want to, uh, to acknowledge that. Uh, and. Um, I also, uh, I'd also like to say how uh, wonderful it's been the last couple of days to see uh, old friends, old colleagues. Um, the only time we ever seem to see, me, or see each other is at conferences or readings. And uh, I've always said our community is, um, is like one big family. And, uh, sometimes uh, it takes a long time to see each other. And of course, meeting new people uh, in, in our family of writers to meet people like uh, Beverly and what, uh, what an honor it is. Beverly, I got thinking about you just, uh, just as I was sitting here and I got thinking about, um, about um, what we were talking about uh, yesterday. We were talking about uh, Chief Crowfoot. We were talking about how uh, Chief Crowfoot had uh, adopted um, one of our chiefs, one of uh, the Cree chiefs, uh, Paul Maker. And uh, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to, um, this particular poem I'm going to start with uh, tonight, I mean, some of you have heard this poem before, so forgive me, but um, this poem is um, really a poem that had been, it's not even really a poem, it's more or less a conversation uh, with my grannies of five generations ago. These were the original Cree women from York Factory area. These were the women that became the country wives of, um, of the Hudson's Bay men. So, my background. I got thinking about these women one time, and I, I started to talk to them. I was very fortunate that I grew up with um, speaking the Cree language. So this, uh, the, this conversation, this poem is for them. But the beginning of this poem, I want to dedicate uh, the, the beginning of this poem to, uh, to the people on whose territory I stand, and uh, to uh, Chief Crowfoot and to uh, Palmaker. This piece is called Prayer Song for the returning of names and sons. Oh, yeah. 
Chapanak Charlotte, Sarah, Mary, Ego Christiana, Ahau Kaya Soji Nawimak, Nakunda, my song, Nigamoin. How this song I am singing to give you back the polished swan bones, the sewing, all the birch bark bundle holding the wet stone, the drawing stone, the pounding chunk cherry stone. Oh, the spirit of your Esquio names, the ones not birthed from the belly of their ships, not taken from their Mantoy Masanagan, oh, their great naming book. In Chapanak, Charlotte, Sarah, Mary, Egwa, Christ, E, Anna. These are the names I have thrown back across the water. I have given back to their God who has two hearts, two tongues to speak with. How? Natuta, my song, Nigamuin, the renaming song. I am singing five generations later. Natuta, my prayer song, so you will be called sung as tattooed from the lip to the chin woman, hey, hey. Sung as she paints her face with red ochre, hey, hey. Sung as charm woman who is good to make a nation woman, hey, hey. I give you back in Chapanak the names to name the names of bones, Oskana. You laid down to build them a house, how the blood Miko and warm earth skin Aski that built them an empire. Natuta, my song, Nigamuin, this prayer song I am singing to bring back your stolen sons whose sons and sons and their missing bones are unsung geese lost in a country across the water. In Champanak, I have thrown back your names, Namoy Kiawao, Charlotte, Sarah, Mary, Hego, Christiana, Namoy Kakya, Munya, Suwak, Ahau, Inchap, Nakaya, Sochi, Nigawimak, Natu, Damay, Song, Nigamoin, this prayer song I am singing. Hey, hey. from a, a collection that uh, Tasha mentioned called Kibochiden, which, uh, which uh, I'm almost embarrassed to stand up and say the word Kibochiden, <laughs> not the territory. The reason being, Kibochiden in Cree is a, a, a slang word for, um, for, being, uh, for being mute or being silenced. And, um, and, and, and uh, if, if you buy this book, when you buy the book, you'll find out all, all why I've said about being mute or whatever. But I don't know if I'm going to be reading from this book in Blackfoot territory because uh, <laughs> Beverly uh, told me earlier today, Kibochigan, or something that sounds like that, is very, very close in Blackfoot, meaning ten penises. <laughs> so I'm either going to have to, uh, you know, stand like this. <laughs> or run fast. Or run really fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting being in Blackfoot territory and speaking Cree, singing Cree prayer songs, reading, um, reading, uh, reading this particular poem, which is a new poem, it's called I'll Teach You Cree. So, uh, <laughs> I'll teach you Cree with the tip of my spring tongue. Ayiki, your mouth will be the web catching Abikis' words a crawling out ceremony that cannot be translated. How, Bikisqui. I'll teach you Cree, Nihiawiwin, that is the taste of Bimie Wasaskatumana. Your mouth will be the branches I am picking clean, a summer heat ceremony that cannot be translated. How, Bikisqui. I'll teach you Cree in the winter, Pipun. When the dogs curl against our backs, your mouth will be bawajak and asis be sim that cannot be translated. It will be a ceremony. How bikis we? I'll teach you Cree, Ikuk Mr. Hi Sadita, 
It'll be in the fall of this ceremony. You will have the mouth of a beaver, thick and luminescent. I will make my camp there. This cannot be translated. How? forever in bloom, the north and south Saskatchewan rivers swirling and meeting like the skirts, the hands of cloggers shuffling their moccasin feet. I've been told half-breed heaven must be old Gabriel at the gate calling, Tawau, Tawau, toasting new arrivals, pointing deportees to the Buffalo Jump or down the Great Canadian Railroad like Selkirk or McDonald. I've been told half-breed heaven must be scuffed floors and furniture pushed to one side, grannies giggling in the kitchen, their embroidered hankies, teasing and nudging the sweetest sweet sixteen, who will snare the eye of the best jigger. I've been told half-breed heaven must be a wedding party stretched to the new year into a wake, a funeral, then another wedding, an endless brigade of happy faces and squeaky wheeled carts loaded with the accordions, guitars, and fiddles. I've been told half-breed heaven must be a rest over for the greats, Hank Williams, Kitty Wells, the Carter family, and Hank Snow. It must be because I've been told so, because I know to many tea women who sing beyond the blue. I'm going to kind of end off with a dirty poem. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I should end off with a dirty yes. poem. We'll have a dirty night. We'll have a dirty night in Blackfoot territory. Um, this is. Uh, I, I'm not going to call it a dirty poem. I'll say it. It, it, it is a. It, it's an erotic poem. And um, I was. Uh, I was uh, uh, doing the writer in residence in Manitoba. Um, Last, uh, about, a, about a year ago, and uh, this is the only poem that I came away that I came out of Manitoba with. It's called. Uh, <laughs> not that I was doing anything else. It's called the ship. Huh? What about my poems? <laughs> the ship. He is building a ship with his eyes. The bistro boy is building a ship with his eyes. He is building a ship so soundly, I want to give him my mouth, my youth that crawls the deck of his lashes, my tongue, because young Jonah is building a ship with his eyes, the bistro boy is building a ship with his eyes. Jonah is small and not my type. He rides the bus, he drives a skateboard. But the winter light is a hot-lipped whore falling across, across his lashes, who is dangerous after seven, because in this light he uses his eyes to cut pie, his curls to make the salt and pepper shakers come. <laughs> I come each day to see the progress. I come to watch the compass of his fingers. Because I am torturous, Jonah does not know at closing. I think about people, or I think about the heat people leave in chairs, and how if the chairs were his legs, I would arrange them apart. I would make him wide. I would throw him open. I would make him take on water, because he is building a vessel, a ship, with his eyes. But he is not in love. The bistro boy is not in love. He is merely a body of newness. I can smell his salt. I can taste him. Jonah does not know when I draw my evening bath, I am only nine floors above him. Beneath my clothes, my bones are useless. I am as good as landlocked. 
Two provinces away, my captain keeps our ship afloat. Because of this, I drink lattes alone. I keep quiet like a foghorn. But from my chair, I watch the chairs and I watch Jonah, the bistro boy building his ship. Day in, day out, I am more in love because he is tireless, a sea of fingers, so perfectly thorough.